Hey guys, Jay here. Welcome to Miles Memories Weekly, episode 51. Miles Memories is a show about nothing that is filmed in front of a live studio audience. This is a show where I talk about painting, modeling, and wearing experiences from the week. Now you might think to yourself, Jay, you put out three YouTube videos a week and you stream every single night. How could you possibly have more to say? Well, I do. And here it goes. This week, I had a total impulse buy moment. I was at the local Warhammer store and it was packed. And, uh, and I was looking at all the beautiful things on the shelves, knowing that I definitely should not buy anything. Um, but I saw this little beauty and I was thinking, how much fun would this be to have in my hand and be able to go and so I decided to buy it. And I also do have the core box for Aeronautic and Parallel, so I will play this game one day. So this is a, maybe not the world's dumbest purchase, but I decided to buy it and I brought it home and I built it. And actually it was pretty wild working in this sort of a scale. I'm so, so plugged into like miniature war games of like people and vehicles. And so I, I'm used to building like 32 millimeter and 28 millimeter. And it was really weird. I don't know what kind of a scale this is in. I'm sure it doesn't say. Mm -hmm. But this is a teeny, teeny, tiny little airplane in a very different scale than normal stuff. And it was kind of weird to put it together. It reminded me a lot of building model airplanes and tanks when I was a little kid. And it was really fun. It's also very swooshable. Just... Ah, can't wait to, I can't wait to try to paint this. I remember I was, I was talking with the store manager and I was, he was, he asked me what color I was going to paint it. And I said, not black Templar because I think black armor is hard to paint and it often looks kind of bad. It doesn't show off details very well. And on this scale, black paint might look even worse. So maybe I'll go with a Blood Angels or a, a, um, a Imperial Fists with yellow because that would definitely be bright and it would just easily show off all of the details. But now that I look at it and I think about how much I love my Black Templar, I think maybe I go for it and I try to do a Black Templar Thunderhawk gunship and see if I can pull it off and make it, make it look good and make it look really, really cool. I think maybe I can pull off like some microscopic checkerboards, paint some Templar symbols on the wings. God, I also spent way too much time trying to get the wings to, uh, to be able to open and stick. Uh, forever, I tried, I actually pinned them with a paper clip, hoping that that amount of friction would be enough and it didn't work at all. So I ended up wasting all that time clipping them and the way I have it, which I don't know if this is a good way to do it, it seems to be working now. I don't know if it'll continue to work or if it'll deteriorate over time, but I actually put tacky glue in the joints and that seemed to add enough thickness and grit to, uh, to allow me to raise and lower the, the, uh, the attack wings uh, as much as I want, which I don't know if this is the look I love. I've never seen anybody actually glue their Thunderhawk together like this because it is a little bit of a silly look. It's very much Star Wars lock X foils and attack position, but uh, I, wanted, I wanted the option and it'll help with painting so I can get underneath there. But this is a really, really fun little ship. I had another, another uh, a big moment of, of, of what am I gonna do because you can have the landing gears down or up. I'm like, hmm, it would look really good on the desk with the landing gears down, but it's more fun to swish around with the landing gears up. So I think I am gonna go with the landing gears up. It would be, pretty much impossible to have the landing gears down or to have to have the landing gears be be optional because you only get one pair of skids and one pair of legs. So either you glue on the legs and the skids or you just glue the skids into the, the little bay doors where they go. It would not, it would, I suppose it would be possible to drill out these holes and then come up with some sort of a system where they can kind of pull out and pull shut, but that would require quite a bit of engineering, 3D printing, and probably still barely work. So I think I'm happy with the, with them being up. And it actually does sit really nicely because it has this weird little, little dick wing on the bottom. And so it actually sits really nicely on that. So I think I can be satisfied with that. But this, this is a really, really cool little ship and a really fun scale. It was really hard to put together. This thing was so many tiny, tiny parts. I remember in the middle of the building process, I was gluing on this tiny top piece, which is a different part than this wing. And I was clipping it off the sprue and it went clip and then it dinked off of the desk and then went right into my full garbage can. 
So that was fun. I had to dump out all the garbage and go through it. It was a lot of fun. But I now have a Thunderhawk gunship and uh, I'm having a lot of fun. And when I'm, when I'm working on my scripts, I'll just pick this, this little sucker up and just go. But really, really cool little spaceship. Also, this uh, it's way bigger than I thought it was going to be. I assumed that these were going to be a lot smaller. This is like the this is the base that aeronautic units come on. It's kind of big, but it's very very neat. But yep, that is Aeronautica Imperialis Adeptus Astartes Thunderhawk gunship, one Citadel miniature for Aeronautica Imperialis Warhammer. I guess this is a symbol for Aeronautica. Aeronautic uh, Aeronautica Imperialis is an awful name for a game. <laughs> It's really bad. Can you imagine going up to your friends and being like, do you want to play Aeronautica Imperialis? They're going to say no. <laughs> uh, but that's how 40k do. But in other news this week, Games Workshop showed off a brand new mini. And once again, Jay, Jay is always wrong. I was sort of wrong. Early, early on this year, I had a video where Games Workshop put out a video teasing a bunch of new models coming out this year, and they showed off just little, little close-up snippets of the miniatures, and I said that it was almost certainly new Tyranid Shrikes, the Tyranid Winged Warriors. But I did say at the very end, it could be a Parasite of Mortrex, but I don't think so, because the Parasite of Mortrex hasn't existed in Tyranid Codexes for a while, it never has ever had a model in the past, and so I assumed it probably wouldn't be that. But, lo and behold, I was wrong. Games Workshop showed off today the new Parasite of Mortrix Mini, which looks fantastic, and I gotta say, I really dig it, number one, for the aesthetics. It's a really, really badass looking model. And number two, it's super, super gimmicky, and I love a gimmick. Honestly, I wish that 40K was, like, I wish 40k had a lot more gimmicks in it because 40k is a game full of like stats and uh, powers and you know my strength four is better than your strength five or strength five is better than strength four and you kind of math hammer everything to see what's better whereas it's hard to really math hammer a gimmick and speaking of the gimmick so this is the parasite of mortrix and it's a parasite so it can it can stick people with its barbed ovipositor, which is a melee weapon, which at least seems pretty good. It seems like it'll usually hit. And then it gives you the parasitic infection. Each time an attack made with this weapon successfully wounds an enemy unit, excluding vehicle units, that unit suffers one mortal wound in addition to any normal damage and becomes infected with parasites. At the start of your opponent's command phase, for each enemy unit that is infected with parasites, your opponent must roll 1d6. On a 1 through 3, that unit being rolled for suffers D3 mortal wounds and is no longer infected with parasites. And on a 4 through 6, that unit being rolled for suffers D3 mortal wounds and remains infected with parasites. If that unit suffers 2 or more mortal wounds as a result of this ability to this phase, set up a new friendly High Fleet Ripper Swarm unit on the battlefield within 3 inches of that unit and not within engagement range of any enemy units. That Ripper Swarm unit contains one model and if you are playing a game that uses a points limit, it does not cost any reinforcement points. Games Workshop is wordy with their rules, but it is kind of neat. There's a there's a slim chance of getting to spawn in Ripper Swarms if that unit remains infected and uh, and you roll two or three mortal wounds for that unit in the enemy's phase. So in that person's turn, they have to roll. I guess you roll to see if uh, in their turn a Ripper Swarm spawns right next to them, which is kind of fun because either they have to waste shots killing the Ripper Swarm or they ignore it, do whatever they want to do that turn, and then next turn they get charged by a single Ripper Swarm base. Honestly, I think that they were really, really um, cautious with this. I think I think it should have just been roll to put down D3 Ripper Swarm bases <laughs> right next to the enemy. Why not? What's really, are the Ripper Swarms gonna, gonna make or break break the whole thing? And I'm, I'm assuming Parasite Amortrix is gonna be, an, is a named character, so you're only gonna be able to bring one so I think it's going to be pretty situational when you're going to be able to pull off the parasitic infection. I think you'll usually pull off infecting them and getting the D3 mortal wounds, but planting the Ripper Swarm is going to be maybe once or twice per game. So, but I love a gimmick. I love a gimmick. And this is a very, very gimmicky rule. And speaking of gimmicky rules, that comes with another rule called it itches. 
When a unit is infected with parasites, it loses the objective secured ability. It itches! They're so busy, like, itching their skin as these ripper swarms are bursting out of them that they can no longer hold the objective. That is the greatest thing I've ever heard. Greatest rule name of all time, it itches. I absolutely love it. This is a super, super cool unit. I think, I think that this is going to be one of those units that you just include in the army. Because why not? It's just so much fun. It's got really, really good movements. It actually seems like it's going to be set up to do really decent damage. I mean, six attacks, strength five. They're barbed of Oh, no, you only make one attack with the barbed of a positor. So we haven't seen if they're going to have other weapons or not. They might just have like strength user weapons yeah, as their talons, but they might have something else, too. But uh, yeah, it seems like this is just going to be a solid, a solid little model. Not a game breaker, not a something spammable, but uh, it's really neat. The, the Tyranids, the Tyranids have kind of been in need. It, it's hard to say any of the factions are really in need because everything has so many units already and the Tyranids have tons. Really, I think what the Tyranids have been needing a lot is um, just their weapons to get to get a buff. I remember looking at the rules for the Tyranid Warriors and the Tyranid Warriors have like eight weapons options available to them and they're all about the same. Like, except for the flamethrower one, they're all, they'd all do pretty much the exact same thing. But I think they just need uh, their weapons retooled a little bit. But it would be, it would be nice if they got a bunch of new units. And Games Workshop has previously shown off this model. And so, you know, they showed this one off, they teased it, and now they finally released it. But the Codex isn't out yet. So it is possible that hidden inside of the new Tyranid Codex is going to be a couple of more new Tyranid models, which would be absolutely dope. I would still love to see some Shrikes because I love the idea of like an all winged Tyranid army. I mean, you could have the, the winged uh, brood lord, swarm lord, flying, flying hive tyrants, the flying hive tyrants. You got your parasite of Mortrix hanging out next to him. You've got tons and tons of gargoyles and then some Shrikes would be lovely. That would make for a really, really cool army with, and just give you some good options. I love, I love when armies have, give you like optional builds. Like with Eldar, you can go like Wraith Knight heavy, or you can go Foot Slogger, or you can go Bike heavy, I guess, too. Orcs, you know, you can go, you can go all Mechanized with Mega Knobs and Gorkonauts and Warkonauts. You can go Bike heavy with lots and lots of bikes and buggies, or you can just go Green Tide and just bring buttloads of Orcs and Gretchen. And so I love, I love when you have those, those options for building. Uh, a lot of the Xenos armies seem to do that really, really, really well, and the Imperium armies seem to not. I guess with Imperial Guard, you could go Horde heavy or mechanized. Space Marines are kind of Space Marines or Space Marines or Space Marines. I mean, I guess you could go with like heavy Intercessor spam versus regular Intercessor spam. But I don't know if plus one toughness is really the difference between the play styles. Sisters of Battle or Sisters of Battle. Are there options with Admech? I guess you could go ranged with Admech. You could have a lot of um, uh, the Dune Striders and the um, the robot horse cowboy guys. I love that there's literally robot horse cowboy guys. It's a lot of fun. 40k is very serious, everybody. It's a big. It's a big deal. You know. Let's you know. Let's 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 be let's be reasonable here. Serious business. 40k. But yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited for Tyranid players to get something. You know, Tyranid players, they went a long, long time without a lot of new models and new stuff. Uh, I didn't hear much complaining. Eldar players, I heard complaining every single day. Not to be fair, Eldar players had like a 20 year wait, whereas Tyranid players only had like a 10 year wait. But still, Tyranid players, good on ya. You guys are good sports. It has been an absolutely crazy week prepping for some upcoming videos. We are working on a very, very large project. Stay tuned. But while I was doing all of this crazy painting, I was wearing this Eons of Battle t-shirt. If you think that this is really, really funny and you would like to pick it up, you can find it linked in the description below. We also have another shirt with a futuristic space soldier that you might recognize. And that shirt is also really, really cool. These also come in sweaters and the sweaters are really, really comfy. But if if uh, if swag isn't your thing, we also have a the Eons Battle Patreon, which is the best way to support us making videos. 
Over there, you're gonna find a lot of behind the scenes, voting what models I paint live here on YouTube. This little guy might make an appearance one of these weeks. Tons and tons of grim, dark 3D printable terrain and a weekly hangout. We're on Discord where we all hop into a room and chit chat and it's one of the, my favorite things that we do. It's a really, really great way to end the week and it reminds me exactly of hanging out at the local Warhammer store and just chit chatting with the nerds. It's a lot of fun. Also, you get a fourth episode of Eons of Battle every single week. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, Patreon is the place to be. But speaking of things that I was working on this week, I was thinking about Primaris and how much I love Primaris and how much other people hate Primaris. And I've always kind of heard that the lore of Primaris sucks. It's garbage, it's terrible. They should have just made true scale Space Marines. They didn't need to do anything different. And I was thinking about it and this new lore is only couple of years old, like three years, the start of 8th edition, maybe a little more than that. But there hasn't been that much published since the start of this new lore. And I figure I can read it all. And then I will know, because why would the new lore be bad? I mean, people love Black Library, people love the Games Workshop lore, people love the codexes. Why would Games Workshop all of a sudden just be bad at writing lore for Warhammer? I get that it's changed and all change is bad, but I decided to start on this little endeavor of learning all there is to learn about the new lore of 40K, and I started reading the first Gathering Storm book. This has been, the, the Gathering Storm books are something I've been wanting to read for a while, and now that's they're available on Warhammer Plus, which is Warhammer TV and Warhammer Vault and Warhammer app, because Games Workshop loves to spread everything out. Don't make it one perfect convenient place. Really, really spread that out. God, the first time I tried to find Warhammer, the Warhammer media that you can watch with a Warhammer Plus subscription, I typed in Warhammer Plus. Nothing on the first page. Nothing on the second page of Google. Because it's not, you don't watch things on Warhammer Plus, you watch them on Warhammer TV. And if you don't type in Warhammer TV, it's not going to come up for you. <sighs> but anyway, I'm reading the Gathering Storm books, and I, I finished, I got halfway through the first book. And it's... I think it's really good. I've really been enjoying it. Uh, it started off a little weird because it's written in a different style from some of the other Black Library novels I've read in the past. But I actually, as I started to read it, I really started to get into it because it's it's a it's kind of it's kind of got a gimmick to it, and it's written in a very old way of writing things. Like if you've ever read like Moby Dick or something from like the 1800s, the, it's written. At, from the perspective of the time, and so they use a lot of language that we don't use anymore. And that's how the Gathering Storm books are written. It's kind of written from a third-person perspective, but a third-person perspective in the universe of 40K. So they use words and old-timey words and expressions, and it really helps you kind of get into the zone of what you're reading. And I really, I really started to dig it. At first, it was just kind of frustrating me because I would kind of get lost in this weird flowery language and uh, fake Latin. But after after a little while, I really started to get into it and it kind of helped me. It's kind of it's kind of like when, it, you know, in a, in a movie, the settings and costume and cinematography kind of sets the world for you and then you just get lost in it. And that's kind of what this book has done. And it's really, really interesting. And it's really, really cool. I, the fall, it's all about the, uh, the, the Horus, not Horus, but it's the little Horus but not Little Horus from Horus Heresy, because there is a character called Little Horus. Um, Abaddon, Abaddon is a spoiler. Uh, and he's leading another another crusade to destroy Cadia. And uh, the people, the the our heroes defending Cadia are having a really bad time. And you hear from all of these different perspectives. You've got um, like a Space Wolf successor chapter or just a different grouping of Space of uh, space Wolves. You've got Black Templars. You've obviously got Cadians. You've also got Mordians and all of the different other different Cadian forces and uh, Sisters of Battle and Skitari. And you, you, they're all preparing for this attack and they're all dealing with the invading chaos. And it kind of jumps from perspective, different perspectives in a really interesting way where because all of this stuff is happening simultaneously, but you'll be hearing the story from the perspective of uh, Captain Creed, or Colonel, Colonel Creed? Castellan Creed? Creed, everybody knows who Creed is. 
uh, Creed is in charge of the battle and you'll he'll have a chapter from his perspective and then it'll kind of end on a little bit of a cliffhanger and then you'll be listening and talking hearing from some space marines and then all, all of a sudden you'll be you know you now you're engrossed in these space marine stories and then the space marine story will end at the same moment that Creed's story ended and then the paths converge and then they move off in that direction and it's really 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 interesting it's a really really fun way of of reading the story and it gives you and it, it lets you have all of these different storylines happening at once without everything feeling bogged down like does anybody remember in star wars episode one the phantom menace remember that movie where at the end of the movie you have the gun guns fighting the battle droids on the plains of naboo you have queen amidala assaulting the Theed palace to capture viceroy gunray you have baby boy anakin skywalker in space destroying the command bridge and you have the jedi fighting darth maul and all four of those stories are happening all at the same time, cutting quickly back and forth, making it a giant jumbled mess. Well, that's not how The Gathering Stormbook is. The Gathering Stormbook is actually written in a really, really fun and clever way. And there's a lot of, like, I mean, it's a war story, but there's actually a, a lovely amount of humor to it. Uh, a lot of the humor kind of stems from Creed, because he's just so beyond, like, serious and intense that's uh the the fun moments where things are kind of turned where like he's kind of not proven wrong when surprising things happen to creed it's really funny and i really really been digging it uh slight spoiler alert but it, i promise the spoilers don't matter if you've watched a youtube video you it's been spoiled for you but there's a great moment where everything has gone badly almost everybody is dead the the imperial guard are fleeing Creed is screaming at everybody. He finds a sergeant who's like praying to, he's got like a prayer pamphlet about the emperor and Creed snatches it out of his hand and he's like, you know, shut up. The emperor's a million miles away. Nobody's coming to save us. We just have to stand and fight. Uh, you know, what do you, you know, no praying for miracles. Boom, the Saint Celestine shows up with an army. <laughs> it's, ah, uh, it's so great. And what's great, um, the book is also written with intermittent first-person perspective stories, and those are fun too. And so it's great because Creed has just chewed out this soldier for praying for a miracle, and then you get like a first-person perspective story from the Space Wolves, and then the next chapter, big old picture is Saint Celestine, and she has arrived and, the, and immediately turns the tide of battle. It's a really, really fun, I, I've really been enjoying it, and I can't wait to continue reading it. There's two more Gathering Storm books, and in between the Gathering Storm books are other novels, and I'm going to read those as well. Um, but yeah, so far I've really been enjoying it. Uh, also, the, it also follows the, the beginnings of Belisarius Call and his mechanical machinations and what he's up to. But Call is always a fun character. I've, I've read Call the Great Works, and it's a really, really fun book. One of my favorite things is... Uh, even though Call does have a real personality, he also has other personalities that he... Because he's like... He's like downloaded himself from many of the different moments of his thousands and thousands of years of life. And so there's a great part where he has to work alongside space marines and he doesn't get along with space marines. So he decides to, you know, download a version of himself that's annoying. And the space marines end up hating him. But he's like, well, that's good because space marines fear me and I can't work with people who fear me. And so if they are annoyed and hate me, that I can work with. It's really, really fun. Call is a great character. But I've super duper been enjoying the Gathering Storm books, and I'll probably be ending the next bunch of episodes of Models and Memories Weekly with uh, with a recap of what I've enjoyed and what's been going on in the Gathering Storm, because I've always, I, it frustrates me when I'm always told, oh, that sucks, it's not good, it's garbage. I, I want to make up my own mind, and so far, I've been enjoying it. It also doesn't feel wildly different from any other 40k novel. Like, it's not... I mean, it's a war on Cadia, you know, is that, that's not some new, unbelievable event that could never possibly happen in 40k. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty par for the course, but I've really been enjoying it and I can't wait to, to read more. But that is what I worked on this week. I built a little airplane for myself and I read, and I read a comic book. A really, really good time. But that'll bring this episode of Models and Memories to a close.